quite a beautiful view from here uh, the balcony of the museum lovely view of the, the abbey church and the uh, abbot house and it's just stunning so this is uh, Dunfermline uh, Scotland's new city and it's been a long time coming there's nowhere else in Scotland that deserves that title more but how to begin there's something I want to show you so and it's nearby come with me This plaque is on a wall in the garden of Abbott House. Um, Abbott House is a, an old, old, old house. Thought they date back to the 16th century, but the, the main fact be parts of the house that go back further than that. Like a lot of old buildings, it's a bit of a an architectural and. Uh, historical jumble of ages in, in architecture there's a, a gift shop and a cafe inside this plaque gives the location of a grave and it is the grave of Lady Margaret Crawford um, the location is, is thus lies buried beneath a thorn tree in the grounds of Dunfermline Abbey and that thorn tree is just over there come with me This is that thorn tree, just in the grounds of the abbey and the grave of Lady Margaret Crawford. And Lady Margaret Crawford was the mother of Sir William Wallace. 
and I think you can probably instantly see that Dunfermline is a very special place as far as the history of Scotland is concerned. After constant Viking raids in Iona, the burial place of Scotland's kings was moved from there to Dunfermline. From 1094 to 1329, something like seven Scottish kings were buried here. Dunfermline was not a royal borough for nothing. When I say something like seven, what I mean is it may actually be eight. Malcolm Canmore was buried in Tynemouth Priory, but then dug up and reburied at Dunfermline with his wife Margaret. But some sources still have him buried at Tynemouth. Those kings were buried in the 11th century abbey, founded by Queen Margaret, later to become Saint Margaret. The nave of the abbey church survives, but the choir and east end was trashed during the Reformation and much of the interior, including the tombs of King Robert de Bruce and of St Margaret, were destroyed. In the early 19th century, the east end of the church was rebuilt and during construction a body was uncovered. Wrapped in a shroud with gold thread and encased in lead, this was clearly someone very important. But who? Attacks on the church by Edward I and later by Protestant reformers, combined with the upheaval of a new build, meant that bodies had been moved and the exact location of interred kings was not known. However, when the lead was peeled back, it was found that the sternum, or breastbone, of the skeleton had been cut to remove the heart. It seemed probable that this was the body of Robert de Bruce, whose heart was buried at Melrose Abbey, but some uncertainty remains to this day. The body was reburied, but not before a cast was taken of the skull a cast that in recent years has been used to reconstruct the face of King Robert the Bruce.
In addition to being the burial place of kings, Dunfermline has long been a place of pilgrimage. Pilgrims travelled, and still do today, from all over the world to visit the Shrine of St Margaret, once located inside the Abbey Church, but now outside. There is also a cave where Margaret prayed, now located deep down below a car park. In the past we had something of a gory fascination with death and bodies, especially if the dead person was well known. Bodies, like that of William Wallace, were being cut up and sent to all four corners of the kingdom as a warning. The heads of enemies were placed on poles and displayed, again, as a warning. Something of an industrial process grew in order to deal with the bodies of saints. A saint's popularity, not to mention special powers, perhaps even in death, meant we all wanted a little bit of them, and practically every bone in a saint's body, even down to the toes, was dispatched to all corners of the globe. The body of St Margaret was no different. It is said that Mary Queen of Scots put in a request for St Margaret's head, so that it might provide some spiritual assistance during the birth of her son, James VI. Today, visitors can not only visit St Margaret's shrine, but see one of her bones, her shoulder blade, in St Margaret's Roman Catholic Memorial Church in Eastport. To see such a thing today in Dunfermline is really very special.
can hard to imagine then if we are nicer and more pleasant than the garden attached to the museum or even the garden adjoining this one which is behind Abbott House it's just full of plants and stuff flowers which is I suppose what you would expect in a garden but they just have a really nice feel about them and I could probably spend quite a bit of time just sitting here <laughs> so that was Dunfermline Scotland's new city and as I think I probably said earlier it is packed with stuff it's oozing history it's, it's, it's a city that is been at the very core of Scotland's past and as I think I may have said earlier when they stopped burying Scottish kings at Iona because of Viking um, well the Vikings took Iona over and they changed the location of the the site for the burial of Scottish kings from Iona to here at Dunfermline Iona is a very important place it's a place of pilgrimage Dunfermline is every bit as important whether from the angle of the burial of Scotland's kings or as a pilgrimage to St Margaret's Shrine in its own right and I haven't seen half of it I've just given you a taster here there's other stuff like a small museum that is in fact the birthplace of Andrew Carnegie and like lots of other things it's very much worth a look the whole city is worth a look but don't take my word for it visit Dunfermline for yourself I'm Eddie Burns Bye for now.